we've not been including the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so important, I think, if we're going to create inclusive communities, we have to own the reality of what our systems have created. We have to recognize that. And we have to critically examine how they can be then modified to uh, to make a difference. And so I, I, I think that that's a very exciting uh, forefront for us. And, you know, diversity has always been important to student affairs people. Yes. This is not a new topic. It certainly looks different today. It has different details uh, mm -hmm. because we basically we're just drilling down. Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today, we have a special conversation with another student affairs legend, Denny Roberts. Denny was ACPA president, a senior higher ed leader in the US and in Qatar, and a deep learner and contributor around leadership and many other things. Thank you so much for joining us today, Denny. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and online learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find more details about this episode or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. This episode is brought to you by Stylus. Visit styluspub.com and use promo code SANOW for 30% off and free shipping. Today's episode is also sponsored by Simplicity, a true partner. Simplicity sports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach. You can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. I'm broadcasting from my home in Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the intersections of the ancestral homelands of both the Dakota and the Ojibwe peoples. Denny, let's get to you. I'm so glad that you're joining us today and here for this conversation. Uh, we talked a little bit leading up to this about the many different places we go, and I'm sort of excited about where we plan to go and where we end up going. But let's just begin by hearing a little bit about your career and your life journey as a leader, as a scholar, and maybe even a musician and anything more. Tell us a little bit about you. Well, first of all, thank you so very much. I'm, I'm honored that you would include me on a list of people to uh, to chat with. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy these kinds of things, uh, especially because I am now uh, retired. Sometimes I refer to myself as semi-retired because I really can't accept the concept of being retired, but uh, I, uh, I I really am honored by it, and uh, I hope that you know this reflection time will have an opportunity to uh, you know resonate with some people and bring up some issues that uh, folks might want to think about. So, uh, I was uh, I'm a, I'm a native of Colorado. I was actually born in Arizona, but I, I grew up in Colorado in Boulder, and uh, Boulder these days has a reputation of being kind of a glitzy, glamorous, expensive sort of place. It was not when I grew up there. Uh, it was actually uh, just an amazing place because it uh, had the University of Colorado, had the National Bureau of Standards, had the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So it had scientific and educational focus, but there were a lot of just regular folks who lived there. And uh, my family actually moved there in the 50s uh, to... Uh, own a farm and, and worked on a farm. So I lived in the countryside for the early part of my youth. And uh, what's significant about Boulder was that it was kind of an unpretentious place in the 50s and 60s, but yet it was very progressive, mm -hmm. very educationally focused, and uh, a place where people were just really kind of thinking in different sorts of ways. And, you know, of course, people kind of stereotype the hippie movement and, uh, you know, they think of the hill uh, of University of Colorado, where a lot of the political and kind of social things occurred, particularly in the 1960s. Well, I was in and around that all the time, uh, but I thought that was the way everybody lived, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was amazing was that I had no one in my family who had ever been to university before, mm -hmm. even though we lived in a university town. And so uh, I had no clue what higher education was really all about, but I primarily learned that from high school classmates. And I remember high school classmates getting uh, awfully uh, dedicated to their application processes and talking about schools like Dartmouth and Middlebury and 
I was just thinking like, why on earth would you go to school like that when you could go to Colorado State? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I had no idea that higher education was in fact organized by a, a hierarchy of elitism. Right. I had no idea, mm -hmm. uh, let alone how to actually begin to negotiate it. But fortunately enough, I had classmates that kind of gave me the aspiration. And you mentioned music. Uh, I had fallen uh, for music at a very young age, age five, you know, so uh, I started playing piano at five. And by the time I was in middle school and especially in high school, I was uh, competing in various uh, uh, juried events as well as kind of public arts events. And the result of that was that uh, when I started applying to colleges, I was offered scholarships for music and uh that became very critical because at the point that I went to university, my family didn't have a tradition of funding it, didn't really have an idea of what that was all about, but those scholarships really helped me uh, fund my education. And so I chose Colorado State because they gave me the best package and mm -hmm. because it wasn't in my my back uh, backyard. Just far enough away, right? Just far enough away to get some space, you know, so that was really a good thing for me to do. And I had, again, no clue about what Colorado State was all about in those days. And I was primarily engaged in music at the very beginning. And uh, I, I played piano, string bass, I sang. So I did a variety of kinds of musical things. But I also got really connected with student activities at Colorado State. And uh, literally in the second summer, in between my first year and second year of college, uh, I had a friend who was supposed to be on the orientation staff in the summertime. Well, he bagged out at the last minute mm. and told the director, I have this friend that might be interested. And so I had already taken a job for the summer. But when they called and said, would you be interested? I snagged it immediately mm -hmm. and thought that that would be a great thing. So literally, that was the beginning of my real journey of digging deep into student affairs. At Colorado State, uh, I was involved in orientation. I was involved in a fraternity. I was involved in residence life eventually as mm -hmm. a, an RA and a hall director and that kind of thing. And I didn't realize that Colorado State in those days was just full of the early pioneers of the student development mm -hmm. era. You know, so I, the people, I mean, I took my RA class from Ursula Delworth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jim Banning was there, uh, Jim Hurst was there, Denny Madsen was there, uh, Jim Cooter was there. Mm -hmm. uh, there were just uh, these amazing people who were really kind of uh, on the cutting edge of student development work. And they were very excited about trying to foster student engagement and, mm -hmm. and empowering students to do things. So. I mean, I was literally involved in some of the early uh, peer leadership uh, things in orientation. Uh, I was the RA on the first co-ed residence hall floor at Colorado State. I lived in a building or two buildings. They were called the Towers. They were big, tall buildings. And I think they've torn them down now because mm -hmm. uh, they were such a bad idea. But they were 12-story towers. Mm -hmm. One was male and was one was female. Well, in the middle of the year, the guys on my floor decided that they thought it would be a really cool idea if we moved over to the women's tower <laughs> and traded places and tried a co-ed experiment. And uh, I'll be doggone if, if the residence life staff didn't let us do it. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a proposal and we proposed it to the administration and they said, yeah, sure, let's give it a try. And uh, it was a real success. And uh, within two years, the entire buildings, both of them, were integrated in terms of alternating floors of uh, men and women. So I was involved in that kind of thing. I mean, uh, because I was a music major, I was obviously very, very dedicated to trying to get music into other people's lives. So, you know, I, I asked my director if I could buy a grand piano for the, the, uh, the commons area of the tower. Mm -hmm. They found the money. I went to Denver. I picked out the piano. They bought it. And I started an art series mm -hmm. right in our, our residence hall as a result of it. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of example of, can you imagine, you know, in the 1960s, being able to just create that much and to be mm -hmm. so empowered as a peer. 
And I, I know that that was very unusual for many institutions at that time. And what that caused me to do was that by the time I got to my senior year, I, I couldn't figure out how I was going to make a career out of music and mm -hmm. particularly of performance because I knew it took a lot of dedication and a lot of talent and I wasn't sure I had either. <laughs> so, so I went into the dean's office and our dean was Dean Burns Crookston, if you are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And I went into Dean Crookston and I basically started a chat with him about what's your work like? How did you get involved with it? And uh, by the time I left his office an hour later, I was sold, totally sold. Mm -hmm. So uh, I then applied for graduate programs and I included Colorado State as kind of a backup school, but they gave me the best assistantship. So I stayed at Colorado State mm -hmm. for my master's also and continued the, the work, particularly in both orientation uh, in the summertime and residence halls during the academic year. And that landed me then uh, post my master's with doing a job search. And uh, I did it exhaustive when I went to all the conventions, I went through all the placement processes. I mean, I can't even tell you how many interviews I, I had, but I, you know, by the end of it, I was you know, glazed mm -hmm. over in terms of not being able to even think straight, but uh, ultimately had a couple of different options and uh, some wonderful people that had invited me to consider coming to their campuses. And Maryland was the one that uh, seemed to be the most promising. And mm -hmm. I was kind of in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I might eventually want to go for a doctorate. And I knew that they at least had a doctoral program. Didn't know anything about it, right. but just knew at least it was available. So uh, when I got to Maryland, uh, I, was a I was hired as the assistant director of orientation. My boss quit within the first month that I was there. Mm -hmm. And that basically resulted in my being named as the interim director because they had to do something. <laughs> and then they launched a search process. And uh, lo and behold, in the meantime, uh, Bud Thomas was uh, selected permanently as the vice chancellor there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bud selected me to be the permanent director. So uh, I then had a, a great platform to begin to experiment and to use the ideas and the empowerment that I had learned at Colorado State at Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we implemented uh, uh, academic advising by peer advisors. We uh, introduced new approaches through media and experiential based mm -hmm. learning rather than just the talk at kind of programming that was uh, fairly common in many of the orientation programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Maryland was this just incredible laboratory to basically take the ideas that I had learned experientially as an undergraduate at Colorado State and then make them work at Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as things evolved, there was a, another guy that came on, uh, on the scene there, it was Drew Bagwell, and uh, Bud hired him to be the director of activities. And so eventually Bud and Drew got together and decided that they needed to do something that was more intentional in terms of student leadership development. Mm -hmm. And because I'd been pretty successful with the orientation program, I guess, uh, they invited me to come over to activities and to start the leadership program. Uh, no resources, <laughs> just a corner office, relatively small space, nothing to shout about, but it was a beginning. And uh, that year, and this is 1976, that year I went to the ACPA convention and I, I was at a commission four meeting, which is mm -hmm. the group that focuses on student activities, involvement and mm -hmm. Greeks and that kind of thing. And uh, the chair at that time was uh, kind of uh, uh, refereeing a conversation about leadership. And all of a sudden he said, well, you know, it sounds to me like we've got a lot of energy behind this idea as people are struggling with what to do. Uh, maybe we ought to have a task force. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, is there anybody out there that would be willing to chair a task force on leadership? Well, I was dumb enough as a young <laughs> to basically say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And they did it, you know? So they created that task force and uh, 
it was that task force in 1976. We worked for several years uh, to basically gather ideas. And back in those days, you weren't talking about web searches. You were talking yeah. about mail out surveys, getting examples, uh, creating basically a file drawer of all of these uh, options uh, that people were using as they tried to develop leadership in their students. And most of those initiatives were uh, position-based. Mm -hmm. So it was like working with resident assistants or orientation advisors or student government leaders or Greek leaders. So it was very positionally based at that point. However, the task force uh, stumbled into some very, very early writing uh, about basically the need to re-understand this whole idea of leadership mm -hmm. and to be more inclusive. So as we started to dream this all up, we, we thought of ways that we might create a comprehensive leadership program that was available to all students so that you would have programs that were uh, focused for positional, but you would also have those that were just interested in the idea of leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, that task force did a lot of inter-association work with groups like ACUI, NACEA, NASPA. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were kind of networking and drawing in ideas from other associations as well and doing some workshops to kind of stir up interest. And eventually that led then to our um, uh, publishing the book through ACPA, Student Leadership Programs in Higher Education in mm -hmm. 1981. And that book, as far as I know, I have not had anybody ever challenge me, but I think it's the first time anybody wrote explicitly about how to approach leadership learning for students mm -hmm. in a higher ed setting. There had been never, it had never been anybody that had tried to put that together. And that book, even though it's very, very old, it has some uh, absolutely stellar uh, contributors to it. It was an edited book. And we just gathered in the, the best and the brightest that we could find and put it together. And it went out and uh, started to, to make waves in terms of the, the leadership area. So the, the thing with ACPA that was so amazing then was that, uh, and it really is characteristic, characteristic of it today, such an inclusive organization that welcomes young professionals very, very actively. Mm -hmm. And so as a young professional, you know, I had had a great experience with ACPA, uh, with the commission, and uh, I don't even know how I decided to do it, but then I decided to run for the vice president for commissions, coordinating position, mm -hmm. and then that led me to, to running for president and uh, was elected and served as president. My presidential year was 1985-86. So it's about 10 years into your postmaster's career. Right, yeah. exactly. Well, 79 was actually when I completed my doctorate. But okay. yes, right. I mean, I entered the field in 73. So yeah, I mean, 13 yeah. years later, I was able to to get the, the position of ACPA you know, president. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an amazing experience to, to network with so many people and have yeah. the opportunity to shape an agenda. And of course... My advisor, who was Lee Knaffelkamp uh, from the University of Maryland, where I had done my PhD simultaneous to my work experience, yeah. she uh, influenced me incredibly. And mm -hmm. uh, she basically, uh, she was coming up with this whole idea about generativity in terms of the field and the need to create uh, a professional kind of uh, Kind of a, a meaning making approach where you connect with those that are your elders and you can learn mm -hmm. from but also you think of sharing knowledge and of learning and development as a generative process right uh, and so the convention in 1986 in new orleans uh was keynoted by lee and the the title of the convention was generativity mm -hmm. and uh it wasn't too long after that, and actually it was probably simultaneous to it, uh, Susan Colmenez had preceded me as ACPA president, and she mm -hmm. had had a conversation with Lee as well about generativity. And uh, so after the, the convention, or it, was, it may have been simultaneous to it, we created the Generativity Committee, which then began to do some work in terms of historical uh, records and interviews uh, with uh, some of kind of the the uh, 
the key personalities of our field. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Lee was incredibly powerful in terms of uh, she was really leading the charge in terms of student development. And, and all of us that were there at Maryland at that time were just com completely captivated by that. And uh, did you ever have a chance, Keith, to see her speak by a chance? No, I never did, but I heard from Susan Comavis so many uh, wonderful things and connections. And so I felt like she was like a <laughs> another faculty member in the program in absentia because of all of the influence she had had there and, and, and so many of the other people you had mentioned too. She was profoundly influential at Maryland and she was profoundly influential in, as a speaker because she you know spoke at ACPA and ASPA. She also then uh, started speaking at AAG, AACU. Mm -hmm. Uh, so she really got around and she always spoke about student development as a, uh, as a partnership, you know, mm -hmm. so it wasn't just about student affairs people, but it was about student affairs connecting with academic faculty and other uh, areas to be able to foster student development. Mm -hmm. So, uh, those were really heady days, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, saw some of the personalities like, you know, Chickering and Perry and, uh, uh, both of the uh, oh gosh I'm, I'm searching for the names the uh, Doug Heath and Roy Heath both mm -hmm. of them uh, there were a variety of, of really really fun student development people that were leading in those days and, and Lee was kind of the center of that uh, leading yeah. the so I did a lot of that translation you know work mm -hmm. uh, at, at that time and learned it all through uh, ACPA uh, my career in higher education in the U.S. It started at Maryland, obviously, but I also worked at Southern Methodist University, uh, worked at Lynchburg College, which is now known as Lynchburg University. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that is different than Liberty University. Some people used mm -hmm. to get confused and think that Lynchburg was Liberty. No, a very, yeah. very different kind of school. Yeah. Uh, but Lynchburg, and then I went to Miami University. And I uh, the place I served the longest was actually at Miami. I, I worked there for 13 years and uh, continued through all three of those institutional settings to refine ideas about leadership mm -hmm. and uh, try different kinds of models and uh, experiment. And uh, I published quite a bit, you know, throughout that period of time mm -hmm. as I was kind of marking the journey of, you know, what are we discovering right. about what's effective in leadership throughout that time? So those three institutions were, uh, again, great uh, playgrounds to be able to learn things, do things, try things in very uh, innovative ways. And that led then to the uh, last full-time position that I held, which was abroad in Qatar uh, for Qatar Foundation. And uh, the irony of that was that it's the only job that I never sought. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Qatar Foundation had wanted, they had the partnerships with the universities there. And it presently has eight university partnerships. And for people that are unfamiliar with it, uh, it includes institutions like Virginia Commonwealth, Texas A&M, Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, Georgetown, Northwestern. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the American institutions that are there. And <clears throat> the the branches actually were working with the foundation and trying to make sure that the idea of holistic education that is characteristic of those American institutions, the foundation wanted to make sure that the students that came to Education City were getting the full deal, right? Mm -hmm. So not just the classroom, that they were also getting the out-of-class experience as well. And the branches, frankly, were having a difficult time because in the early days, I joined them in 2007, there weren't adequate residence halls, there was no student union, there was nothing connecting students in the out-of-class mm -hmm. environment. So the branch personnel basically uh, lobbied the foundation to create a position that was the second line reporting position to uh, Dr. Abdullah Althani, who was the Vice President of Education, and he coordinated all of the universities, and then I coordinated the student development and support services across those eight branches. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know how like when you go to graduate school and your one of your last courses is to write a paper on the ideal student affairs division? Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I did it. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was a little different because it wasn't within one institution. It was shared across multiple institutions. But man, when I was invited to go over to Qatar to actually try to take the U.S. ideas about holistic development and student affairs and development, uh, enriching the entire student experience, I jumped at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know how long I would stay when I originally went over. It was kind of an open contract and it was renewable each year. And about year five, <clears throat> I decided that there was at least enough groundwork that I could turn it over and mm -hmm. live on. And uh, so I talked to Dr. Abdullah and uh, said, I think it's time to go home. And he said, well, not quite yet. You need to train your successor. <laughs> so uh, he selected a guy by the name of uh, Khalid Al-Kanji, uh, who was a country national as well. Great guy, had a, a, a counseling site degree and uh, just wonderful as a colleague. And so uh, basically he and I worked together for two years in the final two years that I was there to help transition over for him to then head mm -hmm. uh, the, the student affairs area for Qatar Foundation. Mm -hmm. And he's gone now uh, to work for Qatar University and is spreading more of the idea in other places as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's, and, and, and the, I have to say that the Qatar experience, I, I certainly learned more than I taught or mm -hmm gave in that institutional setting. I learned so much about culture, uh, about the need for the adaptability of Western-based ideas in learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just learned so much about you know, complex organizations and how to position higher education as a, as a capacity building mm -hmm. emphasis. Because in the Qatar example, I mean, they were investing in Qatar Foundation and Education City as a capacity building initiative in the country. And it started actually with female students only at Virginia mm -hmm. Commonwealth. And then when they figured out it was really gonna work well with Virginia Commonwealth female students, then it expanded and became inclusive so that all of the programs there are mm -hmm. all in English and they're all co-educational. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, I mean, the, the journey of how that has all unfolded and the difference that it's making in Qatar is pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, for those of uh, the viewers that might have watched the FIFA World Cup, I mean, Qatar took so much heat in the beginning uh, for a variety of things and probably sometimes in justifiable ways in terms of questioning why uh, foreign workers were used to build do the build up for FIFA, mm -hmm. uh, the environment for LGBTQ uh, mm -hmm. athletes and citizens. I mean, there were lots of issues there that were brought up in the early days. I, uh, I've i been very, very public in terms of saying, look, when you're talking about working internationally, you have to understand that Western practices, you don't just walk in and lay them down. And yeah. just all of a sudden, bam, things change. It's a gradual process. And I can tell you, even from 2007 to 2023, those years are like centuries of change uh, in many of our other Western institutions. So there's still work to be done there and there's great people doing it, but man, to see the progress that they've made is truly remarkable. And uh, for me, it was just uh, really a very, very uh, great honor to be a part yeah. of. Well, so, it's quite it's quite a journey. I mean, I, I really uh, let you go there because some of the things that I wanted to ask you about, you were sort of hitting on them as we went. But, you know, you did have the growing up in a farm in Boulder uh, to never having anyone in your family go to college to then earning a Ph.D. And kudos to you for getting a master's at Colorado State and a Ph.D. from Maryland, because I did, too. So we share those alma maters. Um, but I'm just imagining, you know, saying to that intrepid i'll just go to csu on the farm to you're going to retire as a as a running uh higher education system in qatar it <laughs> seems like an impossibility but what a what a journey along the way you mentioned so many wonderful people uh, but you forgot someone 
uh, Susan Comavest told me to, to to be sure to ask you, as uh, <laughs> she said, you have to ask him about Esther Lloyd Jones right. and the effect on his life. Right. Yeah. Well, and and I, I have to say that uh, Susan is herself, you know, uh, an incredible influence in my life. Uh, we just exchanged emails today. In fact, and we're going to catch up week after next. Yeah. She and, says you've been friends for 50 years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, the the closest and longest standing relationship I've I've had. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we're or if if it weren't for Ralph, she and I would be joined at the hip. There's <laughs> no no question. And Ralph is an awesome guy too. Yeah, he's wonderful. But uh, no, Susan is a, a very very dear colleague, and I've learned so much and had so many opportunities through her. And, uh, what a what a uh, an incredible uh, power for all of us. But yeah, I mean, one of the things I did when I was exiting the ACPA presidency. This is 1986. It used to be that the ACPA presidents would, because this is back in the day before there was an executive director. So there was no such thing as an executive mm -hmm. director. It was all done by volunteers. And so on your second year, so the year which would have been 86, 87, uh, I wanted to get as many of the old presidents back to the president's mm -hmm. breakfast as I could find. And so I started digging around to see uh, some of the ones that had not been to ACPA for a long time and discovered that actually uh, Esther Lloyd Jones had not been there for a while and she was right in my backyard. She was living in Dallas at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was working working at SMU. And so I reached out and I said, you know, Esther, I'm, a, I'm the, the past president this coming year. And uh, we really want you to come to the convention and took a little bit of uh, convincing, but she agreed to come. And I agreed to be her, her valet during the experience. And so that first year, I mean, <laughs> one of the most stunning moments was walking into uh, a, a keynote uh, that was being given by Nancy Schlossberg. Mm -hmm. And I had, at that point, I didn't even know all the connections that Esther had. I walked into the room and Esther is in a wheelchair and I'm pushing her in the wheelchair. Nancy sees Esther coming in the back of the room and literally screams from the podium, Esther! <laughs> and literally all the heads turned and there was Esther Lord Jones, you know, mm. and it was, it was like uh, being around, you know, royalty. It was just so mm -hmm. amazing. But the thing that is crazy about Esther was that I'd spent a lot of time then going and visiting with her and corresponding with her for several years up until the point that she passed away and just learned so much from her and particularly uh, one of the proudest contributions I have made through anything in what I would remotely call a scholarship is a videotape that I made of Esther. And uh, it was done under the umbrella of the generativity project. And, uh, you know, I look at, I, I watch that video every once in a while just to be reminded about the ideas that she had. And she was so innovative and she was so far ahead of her time. Mm -hmm. And she really did reinforce for me uh, the critical importance of democratic education, kind of the John Dewey roots, you know, to mm -hmm. student affairs. Uh, she reinforced the critical importance of peer to peer leadership and peer-to-peer -peer influence, how powerful that is. And she also reinforced that this, this profession that we like to think of ourselves as being in student affairs is something that is best given away. Uh, hmm. That in fact, the greatest power of student affairs educators that we have is enlisting students, enlisting other faculty and staff to help us create these incredible environments that empower student learning and development. Mm -hmm. And she said, and she was really very concerned about kind of the, uh, she she looked at the, uh, the early scientific movement in the 20th century and kind of the specialization that was occurring in mid-century. She was very concerned about it because she thought it would create specialization that would then separate people and right. would keep people from collaborating. And that was one of the primary things that I learned from Esther and I carried it through the rest of my career from 
the point that I met her in 1986, 87, all the way until, you know, yeah. I left Qatar. That's been, you know, something I've lived by. So, yeah. Well, and I think it's something that I, as I work with many campuses that they're struggling with is that in student affairs, there's been so much specialization um, that we get siloed, right? And um, you're focused on Title IX and all the regulatory requirements and all the things on that. And we're over here on ADA and all the regulatory requirements for that. And we're over here trying to connect with our alumni and the career center and everybody is busy. Everybody thinks everybody else is too busy. They don't want to impose and it just undermines collaboration. So right. yeah. um, uh, it's it does seem uh, prescient to sort of see some of these trends coming that are now uh, part of the challenges that right. we're navigating. You know, and I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a both and. Uh, yeah in the 21st century. And, you know, I, I've struggled with it because I'm, I'm much better at uh, the, the philosophies of student learning and development and creating models and programs to be able to do that. Yeah. I, the administrative part and the policy enforcement and uh, legal aspects and- The finance. Uh, those, those were not my cup of tea. I mean, I, tol <laughs> I tolerated it. Yeah. I did what I, what I could, but Surely or clearly, there are many people that are much more proficient at the managerial mm -hmm. aspects of student affairs work. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what is what I hear about folks and their work environments now is that the press of the legal and the press of the managerial is pushing out the ability to really pay attention to the learning and development. Mm -hmm. So a vice president uh, has fewer and fewer hours to actually be engaged. I mean, I had the luxury in my career. I taught I taught all the way through my career, all the way through, either mm -hmm. undergraduate or graduate level. And uh, that just doesn't happen much mm -hmm. anymore. It's just really hard to do that. And there's a, there's a theory to practice translation thing that I think occurs when you're involved in uh, the programs and involved in teaching, uh, that those that end up in almost entirely managerial sorts of positions, they just don't have the same holistic perspective. And I'm not criticizing at all when I say right. that. I'm right. saying, man, it's tough these days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I seriously don't know what I would be doing trying mm -hmm. to, to manage in such difficult times. I mean, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you, you've walked us through your career and your life journey. You've introduced us to so many wonderful people who influenced you and that you learned from and that you connected with along the way from so many different places. What's the thing important that you don't want to get a lost along the journey here, uh, an important learning for you that you don't want us to miss? Right. Well, I, I do hope that uh, we don't lose the student personnel point of view. And I know there's language in it uh, that is a little bit antiquated and uh, takes a little bit of translation into the modern era, but there are some essential core truths there. And I think it's it's easy also to think of the student personnel almost in a transactional sort of way. So what does it tell us to do? You know, give me the, the specific uh, functional areas, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, and really the student personnel point of view is more important as a statement of philosophy and as a statement of uh, holistic learning, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, defining our role within that. And I think that student affairs are very important custodians of the idea of holistic learning. And liberal arts faculty, you know, clearly mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. say that they also do that. And yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I go back again, you know, so work with those people, you know. Make mm -hmm. sure that we're both working towards uh, objectives that uh, we can both then claim as victories eventually, you know, when we work right. on that together. So I, I think that uh, remembering our roots uh, is very, very important. And I, I hope that uh, does not get lost. Uh, I hope, you know, and this is a little bit self-serving, but, you know, I think the, the work that has been done in terms of honoring uh, leadership learning, uh, mm -hmm. both for undergraduate students as well as for ourselves and for our graduate students is a very important part of this. When I look back at my graduate training, uh, I got my first introductions to leadership theory actually 
in my doctoral work at Maryland over in the business school. I don't know where you got yours, Keith, but mm -hmm. I got him over uh, at the business school. And I took courses with a, a guy by the name of Ed Locke, <laughs> mm -hmm. who was uh, actually, he was uh, a, a devoted follower of uh, Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. And uh, her philosophies about the way that things worked and so forth are a bit askew from the way my world perspective is, mm -hmm. but his level of rigor about understanding leadership and organization behavior through that specific lens taught me a lot. But that's mm -hmm. the first time I would I had ever been exposed to leadership mm -hmm. theory was through Ed Locke in the business school, you know. And uh, there's a young man, and his name is John Kroll, by the way. So mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful student, master student with me at uh, at Miami, but he did research uh, to look at how well master's programs are actually delivering on providing leadership understanding for student affairs uh, colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he found out that very little is being done. And so he started basically a certificate program, written a book about how to do it better. Uh, you know what I mean? John is really lifting that, that up. And he's saying, mm -hmm. look, you know, uh, if we say that we're about leadership learning, and this is a part of the portfolio in student affairs, <clears throat> We need to be serious about that in terms of our graduate education. Yeah. So I really appreciate the role that he's played there. So I hope leadership learning doesn't get lost as an important part of the student affairs portfolio. Uh, internationalization has become very, very important. And uh, uh, actually, most of my writing uh, most recently has been about internationalization and how to um, include international perspectives within curriculum and specifically <laughs> within leadership learning because uh, the the cat's already out of the box on this. I mean, we live in an international world. We're not moving towards an international mm -hmm. world. We're in an international world. And Susan need... asked me to uh, inquire with you to speak a little bit about international versus global. Right. Well, I, she and I had chose to distinguish those words very carefully yeah. in a book that we wrote together, edited together. And globalization, I mean, people use the two words interchangeably a lot right. of times. Mm -hmm. And globalization really is more uh, born out of uh, uh, economics, business, and, and finance. And it was about the transfer mm -hmm. of products mm -hmm. uh, and resources across boundaries and globalization. And frankly, I mean, especially during the Trump administration, I mean, you heard all of the complaints against mm -hmm. globalism, you know, which was kind of the partially the push, you know, for make America great, you know, mm -hmm. that whole thing was really come from coming from the fear of globalization. And so globalization is really a, more about the business and the finance. And it's also about creating sameness, mm -hmm. uh, whereas internationalization is recognizing the uniqueness of cultures, the uniqueness of politics across countries, the uniqueness of resources, all of those kinds of things, and not saying everybody ought to be the same, yeah. but that uh, we should recognize what the differences are, compare, contrast, modify as necessary mm -hmm. when you're attempting to transfer an idea across boundaries, mm -hmm. but to respect the culture first and foremost, and then try to use the knowledge base to then apply mm -hmm. to the prospect of internationalization. So yeah. does, is that clear enough to you in terms of yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, what is it that, you know, you, you talked about beginning your journey in 1976 or, you know, depends on how we count the beginning, right. but this long career, uh, Miami, Lynchburg, SMU, Maryland, Colorado State, uh, Qatar, all of these different places. And you, um, I think you said before we recorded semi-retired, you just can't give it up. You keep doing this consulting, you keep doing these projects, you keep doing these writings, you keep doing this. Um, so you had this long sort of past and you're also very much engaged in the present of our work. What do you see ahead for the profession? Maybe what excites you ahead for the profession? Maybe what worries you? Prognosticate here a little bit. Right. Yeah. Well, and the crystal balls are are dangerous for people with gray hair so you know. <laughs> uh but you know i i i do believe that the focus on inclusion 
uh, and on uh, therefore uh, kind of deconstructing many of our ideas uh, about knowledge mm -hmm. and the, the sad realization most recently that you know is just right in our face is that we've been teaching history from a very myopic and selective perspective mm -hmm. we've not been including the truth mm -hmm. and uh it's so important i think if we're going to create inclusive communities we have to own the reality of what our systems have created we have mm -hmm. to recognize them and we have to critically examine how they can be then modified to uh to make a difference and so i i i think that that's a very exciting uh forefront for us and you know diversity has always been important to student affairs people yes. this is not a new topic it certainly looks different today it has different details uh, mm -hmm. because we basically we're just drilling down you know we're going right. deeper and deeper learning more and more the language Absolutely. difference uh the yeah. expansiveness as you talked about the generativity of learning yeah just continues to grow so i i think that this theme has always been there and as a person who practiced student affairs primarily in the 20th century i have to beg for forgiveness mm -hmm. <laughs> for failing mm -hmm. uh, because I, I know some of the ideas that I had were not on target. They mm -hmm. certainly were not on target, um, considering the knowledge base that we now have available. Mm -hmm. But I hope you will and others will forgive me for those uh, those those errors and, and just not understanding fully what was going on. And that, I mean, you, you said it. I mean, I, I constantly, I read every morning. Uh, mm -hmm. I blog every day. Uh, I uh, I stay on top of this stuff, and uh, so I've I've not lost my energy for where higher education is going at all. I you I told you that Susan and I had corresponded earlier today. What we're talking about is how to do how to do retirement, mm -hmm. so, because Susan is having the same difficulty that I am, yeah. which is just letting go. There's a certain curiosity that both of us have that we can't let go. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure, maybe that's okay. I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, that I, I see in both of you that that curiosity and that engagement and that um, care, commitment, right? This, this is still important to you. This project that we're all on is still important to you and you have something to say about it. You want to learn about it and engage with it. Um, what else do you see ahead? And the, the the realization there is that it's really, uh, you know, I tried to do some things in some different uh, institutional environments, and you know, the the remnants of those uh, initiatives remain in some cases. They don't in other cases, uh, but it's all about the people. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 about the colleagues. It's about the students. You know, and I communicate literally uh, in my holiday letter or in email with students from all generations in my career all yeah. the way across yeah. uh and in every place i've been uh so uh it's just incredibly gratifying to see you know the see that there there was a difference there yeah uh, and it it's it's very personal in terms of people that are doing very cool work and making a difference in the world and you know that i was ever even associated with some of these folks just uh is mind-boggling it's uh, yeah. very fun yeah well you certainly dropped a lot of names and a lot of really wonderful names people have made a lot of com contributions to a lot of other folks and i keep hearing these themes from you of this connection with these different people who merely shaped you and changed your trajectory and moved you from this path to this path but also you you speak really almost mischievously about your innovation and risk-taking and experimentation and just willingness to right. try new things. And then a constant journey of learning, right. constant journey of um, even what we were just talking about, the things that you're learning now um, and, and looking back at previous choices and decisions, but but really learning. Um, yeah, and, and that is something that I, I had intended to <clears throat> speak at least a little bit about because, you know, one of the realizations that I had uh Kind of late in my career was because I tend to think of things in 
in different ways than many of the people that I'm around. And I, I do believe that that probably comes from an artist's soul mm. you know, that is my music, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I think about music, when I'm playing a piece of music, I'm always trying to think of not the individual notes, but I'm thinking of the, the phrase, you know, right. and I'm thinking of the message. I'm thinking of the historical context. I'm thinking of the composer. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of all of those things in a very holistic way. Well, is it any great wonder that that's then the way I think about my work, right? Right. And that was not always welcome. Uh, yeah. And uh, I I took it personally in some cases in terms of feeling as if, well, you know, maybe I just don't have very good ideas or, you know, feeling as if somebody was uh, in some ways neglecting my perspective or uh, uh, not considering it well enough. And, you know, I, I found out later on that those moments when an idea is not picked up, there's a couple of things going on. Number one, it may not be the time. Mm -hmm. I proposed a number of things that didn't occur when I proposed it, but it happened later, right? Sure. So it was an issue of timing and resources and that kind of thing. And then the, the other part of it is just that uh, when you have a creative or innovative idea, we can't always expect for it to unfold the way that we envisioned it to. That is creativity in itself, is that, mm -hmm. that the act of creation may create something different, and that's okay. Particularly uh, when you have many other people contributing and collaborating. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that realization then frees us up. You know, if you happen to be a person that does think outside of the box, then it frees us up to be able to offer our point of view, not as any kind of uh, an imposed will or this has to be done this way. That's not what it's about, but it's to have a conversation and right. it's about trying to work collectively together right. to do the best that you can. So this out of the box thinking when it's not as welcomed as you wish, not seeing that, not taking that personally, right. but then still offering that and seeing where do other people go with it? What do they create? How do they take it? their agreement, their disagreement. Exactly. I think that's that's a wonderful perspective and some good wisdom for many yeah. of us who get attached to our own ideas too much sometimes. Yeah, yeah. it's easy. You know, yeah. It's very easy to get all wrapped up in that. Well, we are just about out of time. And, um, you know, this podcast is called Student Affairs Now. We always like to end with the, the last question of what are you thinking, troubling, or pondering now? So whether it's related to what we just talked about or just something that you mm -hmm. wander the house ruminating, pondering, innovating about? Well, I, uh, I'm i really struggling with, uh, with racism and classism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm struggling with that in relation to my own local environment here. I live in the North Shore of Chicago. And Chicago has a pretty bad history in terms mm -hmm. of perpetuating uh, racism and classism. Changes are underway. I think that people are being more honest I'm proud that I, I'm right next door to Evanston, which is the first uh, municipality that is even beginning to talk about reparations in a real and honest sort of way. Uh, so uh, I, I'm bothered by that. And there's a particular piece of that that troubles me a great deal. I, I'm a person of faith. I'm an inclusive faith person. So I see lots of different faith perspectives as yeah. being legitimate and uh, critical to find a find meaning in life you know so it's not just my perspective but the perspective that i practice is uh, protestant christianity and protestant christianity in america has done a lot of harm mm -hmm. in terms of racism and perpetuating racism and uh that troubles me deeply. And I'm working with my local church. I'm working with a local anti-racism group to try to do mm -hmm. something about it. So uh, I can't let it go. Mm -hmm. But but that's troubling me a great deal. And you know, when you're when you're talking about it affecting your neighbor, mm -hmm. you know, the person that sits beside you in the choir, mm -hmm. you know, it, this isn't a very, it's a very human and a very personal thing. And I know that people experience it that way all over the place. And as a privileged white person who's had lots and lots of uh, opportunity in life, uh, I don't even begin to pretend to 
to know what to do, but I, I, I know I want to be engaged in the process. So yeah. that's where my head is. Plus I'm playing lots of music. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. imagine. Well, and I think that's a wonderful place for us to conclude as you continue this journey of all the things you've been learning about and thinking about um, and innovating and experimenting and maybe even a little mischievously and then bringing the wisdom of the ego and not taking things personally, but still advancing and still learning and still taking action and still contributing and still being this, this holistic educator that you uh, you've been for so long. So Denny, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing with us and uh, offering so much of yourself. I, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. It's been a real privilege. Wonderful. Well, thank you to Denny. And thanks also to our sponsors of today's episode, Stylus and Simplicity. Stylus is proud to be a sponsor for Student Affairs Now. Browse their student affairs, diversity, and professional development titles at styluspub.com. Use promo code SANOW for 30% off all books plus free shipping. You can find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Stylus Pub. And Simplicity is the global leader in student services technology platforms with state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success, and accessibility services. To learn more, visit simplicity.com or connect with them on Facebook at tw and Twitter and LinkedIn. And a huge shout out to our producer, Nat Ambrosi, who does all the behind the scenes work to make us all look and sound good. If you're listening today and not already receiving our newsletter, please visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com. Scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. While you're there, check out the archives. I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again to Denny for joining us today and your wonderful contributions. You've given me a lot to think about. And to everyone who's watching and listening, make it a great week. Mm -hmm.